My name is uh, Geraldine Cohut. I see very familiar faces here in the audience. Thank you for coming and attending. Um, I am the uh, community liaison for Cathedral Village, which is a continuing care retirement community about 10 minutes from here in Upper Roxborough. Uh, I enjoy doing the presentations. Maria is so wonderful. She has me faithfully on every month, just about. So I really appreciate, uh, Maria, you doing that. And I appreciate all of your input, because sometimes we talk, and then all of a sudden I think, well, let's do that presentation. It sounds like somebody's interested in that. So then that's what I do. I sort of create new programs. Um, at Cathedral Village, we have um, many residents at all levels of care, which is nice. They can move in independent, stay independent as long as they want to, but then we also have uh, personal care services, memory support services, and skilled care. So it's really a continuum of care, and it's very close. So I always love coming here, because I don't have to get on the turnpike to do a presentation. Anyway, today our presentation is Mental Health of Older Adults. When I created the original presentation, I did everything I thought would help people understand mental health. But then, now, I think mental health is extremely important because of COVID, isolation, all of those things that we had to experience for the last two years. Now, mental health is extremely important that we help other people because now we have all of these things going on in the world. So things are just, they're just like this. So yeah, we're this. gonna talk about yeah. mental health, some things we can do, but that is the topic, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Mental health risk factors. Globally, older adults are one of the fastest growing numbers in the United States and the world. The population over 60 years of age will nearly double from 12% to 22% doubling. This is in the world. Mental health and well-being are as important and specific today as at any other time of life. As people age, often have more than one medical condition, which can contribute to how you feel. So, you know, as we age, you go to the doctors, and, you know, after the, the appointment, all of a sudden, my doctor, um, on my chart, she lists all my little things. I didn't think I had all of those little things, but it does happen. So as we age, this is what happens to us. So we have to really help ourselves. She said, yeah, I guess mean, okay, yeah, whatever. Mental health issues in older oh, adults. Right. Mental and neurological disorders account for 6.6% of total disability of older adults. Approximately 15% older, older adults over the age of 60 suffer from a mental health disorder. Significant. Older adults may experience more than one condition at the same time. And you know that's true. You don't just have one problem, you know, you have two, three, or four problems. Added to their issues, they may have reduced mobility, chronic pain, and other debilitating diseases. So the first few slides are really talking about the percentage and why we're, we have to be concerned about our mental health issues. Mental health risk factors. Older people also experience life stressors that are more common in later life. You know, when you're 40 years old and you know, you've raised your family and you're starting to breathe a little bit, 45 years old, you're breathing a little bit, but that's when other things come into, into being. Bereavement after a loss, husband, wife, children, drop in socioeconomic status with retirement. Everybody can't wait to that 65 or whenever you want to retire. And that first day they give you all these parties and balloons and everything. And then that first day, you know, you think, oh, I don't have to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. You know, this is really good. And then the day goes on, and then the day goes on. So you really have to look at, you know, what we're doing. I think the, uh, the socioeconomic is very significant, especially today with everything that's happening with our economy. Um, you become more isolated because before you actually could uh, go to work if you worked out of the home. And you'd see people in the office, and you didn't, if you, they weren't your best friends. You're seeing, visualizing. Also, loneliness can impact uh, as we age, and some psychological distress. 
And I think isolation and loneliness are things you don't think of because you're not isolated. You do certain things, but everybody is not that way. A lot of people don't come out and attend programs and, or go to lunch or things like that. So these are really risk factors of mental health issues. Elder abuse, that's huge in our uh, country. Older adults are more vulnerable to elder abuse, including evidence that one in six experience abuse, physical, verbal, psychological, financial, sexual abuse, and abandonment. So you say, this can't be happening in our country, and it does over and over again. The most har um, harmful situation is a lot of older adults will not report that. They won't tell a family member. They won't tell anyone. Uh, sometimes we might have a, a person that comes into the house to help in cleaning, or perhaps um, the daughter is living uh, far away and she's worried about her mom, so they just sort of have companion people. Well, that companion person, as good as everybody thought she was, can do some things, either physical or otherwise. So elder abuse is very prominent, and certainly you have to be aware that it may exist. And if you have an older friend that perhaps uh, doesn't have a lot of people going in and out of her home or can't get out of her home, just look at those things that happen in our country. Well, I want to say it's not all doom and gloom. There are many older adults, age 60 and above, who contribute to society and have active lifestyles. They are involved and they participate in active members of the workforce. Here's an older adult actively working, uh, involved in supporting family members. That is so, so true in this day and age because as we age and your children age, uh, they need more help. You know, it used to be uh, mom could stay home, take care of the kids, dad would go off to work. Now it's a, a, two people are now working just to, just to keep ends meet. So I think that comes really, really uh, important when you are supporting family members. Um, not all doing gloom, a lot of people volunteer. A lot of people get involved with politics. Don't know how many would raise their hand to that one right now with everything that's going on, but that's what happens. Okay, the problem. The world's population is aging rapidly. Between 2015 and 2050, the proportion of older adults will almost double from 12% to 22%, and that's an approximate. Now, some of these statistics, they are approximate. They also are uh, documented that this is the, the best that they can. As a matter of fact, this morning, I added a few numbers just because I know things change. But this is uh, extremely important. Um, this will be a crisis and connection to the World Health Organization or other associations to support these numbers is very critical. And I use the World Health Organization a lot um, just to determine um, the accuracy of some of the reports that I read. But then again, the World Health Organization has been, in the last few years, um, are they as, um, people are more critical of the World Health Organization as far as even the money that is given to them and how they spend it. But again, I still use it for some statistics, and I think that that's probably a good thing to be alert that, you know, double check. Mental health symptoms. Okay. So if you do have some mental health issues and you're starting to feel any of these, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, inability to cope, suicidal ideation. Now, any of these things can happen to any one of us on a daily basis. That's normal. That's life. But if it goes on and you're still feeling like you're really down, and maybe there's good reason for you to be down. Perhaps you've had a loss in the family, a family member has died, and you're really down because of that. There's a reason for that depression, a reason for this sadness. Um, but two weeks, three weeks, even a month, if, if the loss was great, is, could be normal. But you have to say, after a while, I'm not getting out of this. And that's when you have to trigger it yourself. Or hopefully, a friend or family member will say, oh, what's going on? You know, you're not yourself. Is there anything I can help you with? So I give these to say, if you do have a friend or family member that's just not herself or his self, just, just sort of look into it 
uh, not ask the question yet, but try to figure out why she might be that way. This is a good slide. Dementia and mental health. 50,000 50, 50, million people are living with de dementia, with 60% living in low or middle income countries. A lot of this is from um, saying countries. When I'm saying United States, I will say the United States. The total number of people will increase to 82 million in 2030 and 152 million in 2050. Those numbers are critical. Direct and indirect costs of mental health care, including informal support, has risen dramatically. There is great stress on families and caregivers. Support is needed for both social and economic impact of the disease. So you know the Alzheimer's Association is absolutely, has never stopped to try to find the cure for Alzheimer's and dementia is a symptom of Alzheimer's. So they've tried and di diligently offer programs and presentations and they, we haven't found a cure. We were very, very close to a cure, but it hasn't been found yet. So dementia then also can be uh, a sign after a stroke. You've had a stroke and you're a little bit confused. Uh, you're not eating properly. And that can really enter into the fact that you get a little confused with that. Let's say you're forgetting to eat breakfast and lunch. You have coffee and then you have some juice or maybe a yogurt, dinner you skip. Nutrition is so important. Little things in your daily life you have to really look at. Am I doing the right thing for myself? Am I doing the right thing for my health? Depression can cause great suffering and leads to impaired function. So if you're depressed, um, the first couple of days you're depressed, well, do you really want to get out of your night clothes? You know, well, nobody's coming today. I'm just going to keep my bathrobe on, have a cup of tea. Um, but that's not right. We call that impaired functioning because you're not doing your daily, daily duties. Underdiagnosed and undertreated. Again, that's what it is. Older people with depressive symptoms have poor functioning compared with chronic medical conditions. Increased perception of poor health. So if you're really feeling down and out, and it's going on for two weeks, three weeks, everything goes. You feel like you don't even want to get up in the morning. And that's because you are not feeling like your normal self. These kind of things you have to think about. It's just not normal for you to just you know, not want to interact with people. And that's a big thing with depression. You don't care about anyone nor yourself. Impaired function in daily life. The first stop is that primary care physician. You don't want to go on your own to somebody when you don't know who's good, you don't know who's good at what you have. Talk to your primary care physician and tell them, I don't know what's happening to me. Be very frank, and I hope you uh, all have a good primary care physician but I'm not myself. That's a clue right there. Is there anything wrong? He'll start talking about anything impacting your life. She said, well, just the day to day, but I am not myself. That's a trigger for him or her. Depression can occur with other diagnoses and poor functioning. You must share your feelings with family and physician. I do a program on, I'm not sure if I've done it here yet. It's um, making the most of your doctor visit. And it, when I, the first time I did it, I was like more Pollyanna, you know, and then all of a sudden I started to realize that I have to really stress the things that impact when you go to the doctor. The other thing is the doctor you choose. That's huge. I, I'll tell this little story because if I show it, or if I do it here, you'll say, oh, you already told me that story. But we had moved to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I had a really, really bad cold. Didn't have a doctor yet, so I looked up internal medicine, because I didn't want to find a doctor and then have to go to another doctor. So I looked up the doctor, absolutely credentialed, credentialed, credentialed. I thought, this is going to be my doctor. And it was very close to my, to my house, so that's another good thing. You know, you don't want to have to drive into Center City to go to the doctor, which I used to do. So anyway, I went through all of this, and I thought, this is great. I go into the office, and it's like um, a little, you know, typical people saying where to go, which line to go into. And then I, she gave me papers to fill out, and so then I went into the waiting room. The waiting room was probably as big as this. Lots of empty chairs. 
and it was a 10 o'clock appointment. I thought there'd be people there. The carpet was so dirty. <laughs> mm. Circles of water. Now, I wanted to think it was water, <laughs> but I was shocked. I went to the girl. I said, um, she said, oh, are you finished already, Mrs. Cohen? I said, yeah, I'm not going to keep the appointment. Well, what's wrong? I said, have you looked at the carpets? And then I walked out quietly thinking somebody's going to attack me, but they didn't. <laughs> but that, all that primary care physician is your first step. You have to talk to them and feel comfortable about what you're feeling. Mental health effects after COVID-19. And I shared this because originally, when I first did this, I didn't have COVID-19 in there. We didn't have it. It's a two-year anniversary. And it has affected every one of us. And that's why it is mental health and the pandemic. Because people are still not back. Yeah. They're still not back. Adults reported consider considerably elevated adverse mental health conditions associated with COVID and the pandemic. Effects of younger adults, racial, ethnic minorities, essential workers, and unpaid adult caregivers. Everyone was affected. The population reportedly experienced <coughs> worse mental health outcomes, increased substance abuse, and suicidal ideation caused by physical distancing, stay-at-home orders, and long COVID symptoms. So you remember the rule. Well, we're still in the rule, you know? Six feet apart, um, can't touch, can't do, can't do anything. And Dr. Fauci, you know, and he's, he's on the TV again saying, we might get another variant, you know, we might get another variant. It has put so much stress on our country, on our people. I know people who have uh, passed because of COVID. I know family members that was totally disrupted. Their children not able to go, pardon me, to go to school. That affected every, every one of us. And they all had, and as a result, we really have to do, we really have to watch our mental health issues for sure. Hi, hi, welcome. Thank you. We're into the slide, but I can talk to you afterwards if you want any assistance with what I did before, but welcome. We're talking about mental health. So we talked about mental health and COVID and also the long COVID symptoms. And that's a term that you're hearing now. You didn't hear it before, but you're hearing it now. What is it? The long COVID definition, the World Health Organization official definition is, first of all, about 10 to 20% experience new returning or lingering COVID symptoms for weeks or months post-COVID. We didn't know that was going to happen. We didn't know enough about COVID to say there's going to be another step into uh, COVID. We thought it's over when your symptoms left. But some people, the symptoms do not leave. About 10 to 20% experience new returning or lingering COVID symptoms for weeks or months post the pandemic. Symptoms include fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction. Patients explain they do not feel like their normal <coughs> self. This long COVID may last one to three months. And we're even, even knowing now it's lasting more than three months. So COVID has devastated our country. Now things are better, we're so happy, but I really think just like the flu, COVID will be with us or a strain of COVID. And now that's what they're saying. There may be another strain. There are, it is a definite in Europe and other countries, but this is just really a challenge. But if you hear that long COVID, that's what it is. You've had COVID, you just don't get over it as quickly as some people. And it goes into long COVID. I'm trying to read this so that, because it's, it's appearing light here, so yeah, yeah. We, all, we all feel the same way, so I am reading the slides. Thank you. And I don't know what's wrong because I just... <laughs> Mental health and COVID. Dramatic effects of the aftermath of COVID-19. Extreme tiredness and listlessness. Lack of ability to care for self. Isolation, depression, People have not moved away from the virus. They have not moved. And look at all of these symptoms. It's the same symptoms of 
depression. It's the same symptoms of a mental health issue. Implications of assuring mental health support during pandemic moving forward. Identify potential persons at risk for mental health issues. Prevent and treat potential conditions. Identify issues specific to the pandemic. They are, we talked about it, social isolation, depression, and substance abuse. Absence from school structure, unemployment, and other financial wor worries. Expand use of telehealth. Now I think that has been a good thing that has happened through COVID. Doctor's offices were closed. Doctor's offices were only for emergencies. But what happens to the other 100 patients that you have that is not having an emergency? So during the pandemic, telehealth was created. And if you have used telemedicine, um, it really works. You can talk to your doctor face to face. They can order prescriptions. They can say, you know, Jerry, I know what you're telling me. I think I need to see you in the office. But look how many people did not have to go to the office. Because during the pandemic, you shouldn't go. You shouldn't be in, in the office with other people. A lot of offices don't have six feet uh, mm -hmm. across. I mean, you're crowded like this. So therefore, I think telehealth expanded. Everybody was taught that. And most physicians are using it because, number one, makes it a heck of a lot easier to see somebody on screen than it does when they're waiting in your office and your office is backed up because they always have you know, they, they think they are going to see you in 15 minutes. It takes 45 minutes for some people. So your offices are backed up. So I think that, that is a positive with um, the pandemic. Care strategies. Prepare healthcare provider, providers and our society to meet the needs of the older population. Training health professionals in providing care. You know, when, after you graduate, whatever nursing school, uh, physical therapy, uh, physician, you really see people in your specialty. That's what you see. But so many people are out there that need help. But the, the per persons who are providing the help are not really trained for you, the individual person. They just think they come in, you take, they take your vital signs, you do X, Y, Z, and then you go to see the doctor. There is so much more training that is needed. Preventing and managing chronic diseases, including mental, neurological, and substance abuse disorders. Designing sustainable policies in long-term and palliative care. Develop age-friendly services and settings. So I will say, being a nurse, and uh, a nurse, and an older nurse, that's putting it mildly, but being that, I have seen such dramatic changes in how we see people. There are barriers that, that are up because there's only so many doctors in an area, there are only so many um, people that can be seen in a day, and uh, you know, generally speaking, if you had the 15 minute idea of that physician seeing you, they'll see 30 patients in that 15 minutes, so you know how that goes. <laughs> the other thing that is really impacted is the um, computer. Everything is computerized. So the doctor is talking to you, and he's on the computer like this, and he'll say, okay, now, Jerry, what, what did you say? When were you having that pain? You know, he's not looking at me, and, but he's, he's realizing that he has to get this. If it's not, if he doesn't do it then, when is he going to do it? After the next person he sees? Well, he's going to forget. So he do does it in front of you. So there are so many things that you know, we really are missing out on to make life better for all of us. Health promotion. Isn't that wonderful? Support well-being and a healthy lifestyle. That healthy lifestyle, and you know that that's what you're working towards, is provide security and freedom. Adequate housing, isn't that something very important for all of us? Social support for both older person and caregiver. Target people who live alone. Rural, chronic disease or relapsing mental or physical illness. Programs to prevent elder abuse. Community development programs. 
So these are all things that people in healthcare are thinking about. Have they been able to achieve it? I don't think so because COVID-19 came. They're, they're just trying to survive at this point. Now I'm not painting the all doom and gloom, which I said in the beginning, but it's very hard for all of us to get back. We felt that impact of a loss. We felt the impact of everything changing. You know, even here, before we used, now a lot of people are on online, and that's wonderful. But I know Mary, Ellen, Mary, Mary Angelo, we've said, you know, the room is really filled before. People are afraid to come back. And even though they know they don't have to wear masks and those kind of things, people, I would still wear a mask. I, I wear a mask. I, my husband's not really doing that well, and he's great though. But I, I do it for me, I do it for him. But those things, people don't want to lose that security. And we don't even know how secure it is, but it does feel good when, when you're walking into a place that you don't know or they don't social distance. It is a good security. Mental health care in the community. Community level primary mental health care became the issue. There were fewer options focusing on mental health. Training all health care providers are needed. Long term care for older adults with mental health issues caregiver support and education. These are things that we discovered after the COVID epidemic, pandemic, that we weren't prepared for. It's very hard for me to believe, as a healthcare provider, that we weren't ready for this pandemic. And we've had others, so it's not like this is a new thing. We've had others, but we were not prepared. So I think that it, it is really so significant. World Health Organization. They have been working on these things that we're going to list 2013 to 2022. They have not completed it because other things have come up. Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan. Strengthen effective leadership and governance. We all want that. We want to know that our mental health is being covered by someone. Mental health was really down low. It wasn't one of the first things. Heart Heart's always up there, number one, because people obviously might get a heart attack. Mental health, a lot of people, some of these numbers aren't even accurate, because people don't say, no, I'm really depressed. <coughs> they stay depressed. They don't reach out. Uh, we want to provide more community-based settings, implement strategies for promotion and prevention, offer meaningful and appropriate education for World Health Organization members, and ongoing research for mental health internationally. So again, I'm saying that we weren't, we are not prepared. Uh, World Health is not prepared. There are statistics and statistics talking about mental health, but that's it. Right now, it's still talking. I thought when this first came up, we were going to see community-based services popping up everywhere because people need to see, and they have them, but not for mental health. It's a small fraction of the services that are out there. Mental health, the impact of disasters, emergencies, health crises. In the best of times, as previously discussed, there is untreated mental health going back to 1930. Coconut Grove Fire, 1942, a nightclub in Boston, over 500 were killed. There was no support to assist survivors, families, caregivers, or first responders. Everybody was in shock. 500 were killed. And it was because the doors at the Coconut Grove um, nightclub opened in. They could not get out. Who knew that? They had a lot, they didn't have revolving doors. Now, you know when you go to, um, let's say, um, well, not even a movie. You go into a place that's a big building and they have revolving doors. But next to those revolving doors, it is required to have another door next to it. Why? Well, people say, because some people don't like going through the revolving doors. No, those revolving doors lock when there is a problem. So things have, you know, having that extra door is a big step for us because it is required now. But that fire was just absolutely horrible. Even today, there is inadequate support, as noted, in the Ukraine. Disaster, people flooding in to assist, but, but some too late. Let's see. I just want to share one thing because we're talking about um, the issues that happen um, with 
mental health. Well, in, I guess it was about 19, 1910, um, people were recognizing, you know, that people were just not being cared for right. They had some crazy, they weren't calling it mental health, they had some crazy issues. They weren't part of the community. They were isolated. They didn't want to go out anywhere. And they wanted to do something about it, but really didn't know how. Can't blame that group in that time period. They just did not know how. So, all of a sudden, it was, um, well, they even, even did lobotomies, you know, taking part of the brain out. For years, they thought, about 20 years, um, they thought that might help people that were really having some unusual psychiatric disorders. Well, that didn't work. That stopped because it was not appropriate. But then they built this wonderful Byberry Mental Health Institute, which is um, off of Roosevelt Boulevard. It's in Somerton, Pennsylvania. You go on Roosevelt Boulevard, you turn left, and you used to be able to see about 10 red brick buildings, and, um, and they were all over. And it was all fenced in. And I, people would look at it. Well, everybody that had a mental health issue were sent to Byberry. Well, nobody knew how to take care of people. They were almost in a, put in a building in a room with a bed, if they had that bed. And that's where all of these people went to, from Pennsylvania, from all over. Because other places did not have mental health places to live in, to be cared for. Well, that did not work because at that, it was um, Fiber Mental Health Hospital. Um, it was the Philadelphia Asylum that was worse than any horror movie. People used to visit and they'd say, my mom or my dad can't be in here. They're not caring for her. They were not dressed. They were not fed properly. And then in a, uh, right uh, during World War II, um, there were some conscientious objectors that uh, didn't want to go in the service, but would do anything that they were told. So, well, they didn't have any staff at Byberry, so these, they sent about 50 conscientious objectors to help and care for the patients there. They reported everything they saw because it was so bad. People were abandoned, they were not clean, some were not fed, some were restrained, some were treated so horribly, it was just it was just a disaster. I will say our nursing school, Thomas Jefferson University, used to send the student nurses to Byberry. And there was only one building we were allowed to go into because that was just for teaching. And we'd have to sleep over because Byberry is pretty far for most people. So we had, a lot of the students loved it because all you did all day was sit with the patient, talk and chat, and then you could play at night. You could play games, you could do anything, you could go out. Anyway. Um, I didn't like it only because I could, even though I knew that we were caring for this one building, I thought to myself, what are all these other people doing? It has to be horrible. And it was. Now, not with us. We were really, it was a great education. The residents were well cared for. But I think it's so interesting to realize that in the day, we did not ha know how to take care of people. So anyway, um, about... Uh, 1990, after their conscientious subjectors went in, and that's like 40, 43, 50, 1950. It took 40 years for somebody to say, we've got to close this building. So they started to close building after building after building. And remember, those other buildings were people that, with mental health issues, but were not able to be taken care of properly. They didn't know how to take care of them. They restrained them, they tied them up. It was just awful. So I just wanted you to know that yes, we have come a long way, but we're not where we need to be. And Byberry was such a great example of just no one knowing what was going on, and they didn't know how to treat or, or make them better. The, this pandemic is unique as it has affected the world. The virus, COVID-19, has become the chronic stressor. During the initial stage of the crisis, there was generally a sense of rallying. Remember on television, you'd see people clapping for the nurses that were staying, yeah. spending like uh, three days, no sleep, and the doctors coming out looking exhausted.
but we wanted, the, we wanted those people that were taking care of the people with the mental health issues that they had, we wanted to make sure that we recognized them. So during the initial stage of the crisis, there was generally a sense of ground. The first few weeks of COVID, cheering for medical workers and the spirit of the, of the community. Multiple variants have produced more concern for all. So in the beginning, we thought, this is it. It's going to be COVID-19. These people are going to care for them. We're so thankful. And it's over. Well, it's not. The psychological impact of COVID-19 will affect people differently. Some states have already seen higher suicide rates affecting people of color. The scope of the suicide members are just not fully or accurately counted. Death investigators overburdened with COVID-19 that real numbers have been lost in the chaos. And that line is so true because I'm going to share with you numbers that people have them worldwide after one of the later slides. But the reality is they really didn't know all the numbers. It could have been double what we documented. Although the World Health Organization has done so many investigations, you know, making sure that we are reporting the correct information. But again, um, it's just really um, a devastation. The devastating risk of mental health issues include healthcare <laughs> workers, ongoing symptoms of patients with COVID-19, caregivers, and kids out of school for two years plus. The effect of COVID-19 pandemic on family. Adult stress continues very high. Why? You've heard it. Loss of job. They couldn't go back to work. Now they think, well, maybe I'll stay home because maybe uh, I'll be able to save some money because now I can take care of my children. So that is really loss of job is tremendous. Financial difficulties. Evictions have affected the entire family unit. Pregnant, maternal stress, and adverse pregnancy. And they have demonstrated that there have been pregnancies because of the stress they were under during the last two years. They could affect the pregnancy. Everyone must look out for any signs or symptoms of a problem. Parents, teachers, neighbors, and coaches, everybody that talks to a person, if you see something that's just not the way that person is, we well, don't want to say anything right away. We could say, are you feeling OK? Anything wrong? Anything going on? You want to talk? But those little things are OK to say. But just be alert that there might be uh, issues happening. Adverse childhood experiences, ACE, it's uh, the acronym, uh, can linger, especially those associated with the adult loss of a job, food and housing insecurities. So the kids feel it. They feel it every day when these things happen to their family members. Wellness visits for children decreased by 40%. Outpatient mental health visits fewer than 44%. So those people that needed that outpatient, needed that outpatient mental health, they were not getting it at all. Uh, more than 3.4 million kids have tested positive for COVID-19. That's one of the numbers that we're really not that sure about, but I put it in there because you get the full picture of it. It could be a little bit more. Although death is uncommon in children, the long-term effects have not really been evaluated. The disproportionate effects of COVID-19 across economic, racial, and ethnic lines have highlighted inequalities in America, and we have seen them. There are a lot of people that haven't been tested yet. They're afraid of it. Something's happening, but it is not equal. School feeding programs. I think this is so important. How you get children to feel well and be able to stay the six hours of school time. Schools reopening was an imperative as the impact of school closures affected the most vulnerable. Evidence demonstrates that school feeding programs can increase enrollment and attendance, most especially for disadvantaged children. The feeding programs can also keep children enrolled. So feeding programs are wonderful. They get that hot meal at lunchtime, and sometimes it's other things are packed to go home for the children that teachers know do not have any real uh, financial security. Far-reaching devastation raises the risk of mental health issues, potential increase of suicide risk, ongoing COVID-19 symptoms, family caregivers, children out of school for more than a year plus, greater pediatric emergency, and post-traumatic uh, syndrome. And that has affected a lot of healthcare workers. A lot of healthcare workers say, I don't want to go back. I can't go back. 
I don't want that stress anymore. What can we do now? Well, mental health programs need to expand. CVS uh, Pharmacy really has done a lot of work. They have so many programs available. You can just go to a pharmacist and say, and they'll talk about programs. They do outreach, they do things online. Uh, uh, Walgreens is another one that will do, they're trying to educate so that they don't, so that they feel that they're being a part of the, of the issue with uh, mental health. Here it is again, telemedicine was heavily resourced during the pandemic. We need to expand to underserved areas of the country. So I said, telemedicine is wonderful. It's great for the doctors, it's great for you as a patient. You don't have to go to the office, you don't have to pay parking, so it is wonderful. But underserved rural communities, it doesn't happen. So that's something else that I don't think has still happened because it's not a priority. I just say, vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. And we don't want to go there because there are so many people for, for their reasons that they don't receive the vaccination. You don't want to point a finger or say, well, you should be, or you can have a conversation, dialogue, maybe to move the person along. Maybe they don't know enough. But there are people that are not, and uh, they're, you know, and there are studies now saying, well, you know, if you're not vaccinated, you have X, Y, Z. If you are vaccinated, you have X, Y, Z. So, you know, this whole pandemic has really demonstrated that we need to do more as a country to educate, educate the people that are t sharing these, this information, and educate the people that are living throughout all of this going on. The World Health Organization. The pandemic generated the need for services for mental health care worldwide. This pandemic revealed historical underinvestment in mental health services. When I first started to, when I do something just on COVID, um, I got numbers and all of that and um, everything um, was documented, this is what's happening. But I really understood that the World Health Organization is saying that we do not invest in mental health services. I talked to you about Byberry. That was not an investment. They, they didn't know the difference. It wasn't that they were being mean. What they knew, they had a lot of people that aren't, weren't mentally well, and they had to put them someplace. They used to put them in jail because they didn't know what to do. And isn't that frightful to think that if you have a mental health problem, you could go to jail? So they knew that was wrong. So they built these other uh, institutions. Um, there's another one. It's uh, Pennsylvania. There's another one. I just Epi. Heard. What? Epi. Epi. Eastern Psychiatric. Eastern Psychiatric. Very good. Thank you for my uh, mental laws. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, East, Eastern Psychiatric. That was a little bit better. It was smaller, mm -hmm. and they opened after. Um, the one on uh, Roosevelt Boulevard. Byberry was just another story of people not knowing, people not being mean, but people not knowing the impact. They thought they were protecting the people because they were safe. They didn't have the money. They were walking around nude. They were just, it was just an awful experience. And then when I you know, talked to people about, it, yes, I was, I was a student nurse at Byberry, and they, oh, but remember, we were in the only building that they had people go in, other than staff, because they wanted to get, this was the building that hopefully, if they had all of this attention with the student nurses working with them one-on-one, -on -one, they'd get better, and they'd leave. That was their goal. Now, I just want to tell you one funny story about Byberry. Um, I survived the three months, and um, then I, I, we used to have one patient at a time, uh, generally speaking, for two weeks. So I had one patient the last two weeks that I was there, and um, he was really odd. Isn't that terrible to say, here I am, a nurse? And he just had funny eyes. And I'd go and I'd say, oh, hi, Mr. Brown, how are you doing? Just had these funny eyes. And then I really thought, after the two weeks, you have to document everything, that he had come a long way. I was so happy. I thought I was the nurse of the year. Because we started to chat, we chatted a little bit about his home, and when you went to Byberry in the time, you wore your student nurse uniform, so they knew we had a lot of students there. So, you know, it said Jefferson Hospital. So I just thought I did great. So I left. And I left. We, I was there for the summer, a vacation. So now it's September, and I'm back at Jefferson, 
and I went to this little diner with some girlfriends, and it was a diner that just sort of looked down, it was like sort of looked down and the windows were up top. So I'm having a hamburger, and I just happened to look up. He escaped. He escaped, escaped from Byberry. And I knew it. I knew him like I knew those eyes. So I told my friends, and they said, what are we going to do? Because he was, I mean, he was a bad person. He wasn't just there for mental health. He was not good. He had all these different things happening in his life that he did to people. So there were some medical students there, so naturally you go to the medical students, oh, look, what that, look at that man. So they took me into, like, there was a, a frat house real close. We will take care of this. Okay. So they did. They called the police. They didn't catch him. I went back to the nursing school. I had to be escorted every day to go to the hospital because they couldn't find him. I was a nervous person. Never told my mother. I told my sisters. They said, well, come home. Well, I can't come home. I'm in school. That's what I'm saying. They didn't understand mental health. They didn't understand it. You know, I graduated in 1964. They didn't understand it the right way. So that little experience with me, realizing that I thought perhaps he was able to change, and he was not. So that is my little story. So I have one thing I'm going to read to you, and it's not about, it's just about people. And I think sometimes raining out and all that we've been through, um, it's called, it's a poem, and it's called How to Live Your Dash by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on his tombstone from beginning to end. He noted that the first came his date of birth and spoke the following date with tears, but he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years, February 26, 1942, February 3rd, 2022. But for that dash, for that dash represents all the time that he spent alive on earth, and now only those who loved him know what little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy's being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things that they say and how you spent your dash? <laughs> Just a little yeah. final touch nice. there. So now, are there any questions that I can address? And again, I put a lot of COVID because that's the, these two years, that's the stress. That was the biggest stressor that we were under. And um, how, what do you say? Handled right, not handled right? It doesn't really matter. We're in, we were in it. And now hopefully they'll have more research that can do things a little bit better. But mental health is a real challenge because um, people keep it to themselves because they think it's going to pass. And it may. You know, I said sometimes you go through something that's really bad and you just want to be left alone, and that's okay. And, um, okay, a month. And if, with a death, it could be a year, a death of a, a family member, a spouse. It could be easily a year, as long as you know you're okay, as long as someone reaches out to you, that you're not isolated or that you know there is still a person that you can call if sometimes you just want to say hi and then hang up. But mental health is with us all, good or bad. Uh, it's how you handle it. And some people do really well handling things. I have a friend that unfortunately just died. And um, she was 81. And when we lived in Tennessee, we were neighbors. And we had these, I mean, it's Tennessee, so we had this huge driveway. And we both shared it. So our, our house would go this way and she would go this way. So no, she was just a great person and funny and relaxed. And so she would always say, because uh, it was my first real big move away from my family. Well, my husband was with me, but away from my uh, family. 
And I was kind of, not down, but I was like, I just didn't know how I was going to deal with it. So I did it just, I'm going to ignore it. Everybody else closed their phones and I didn't. <laughs> anyway, so when I was talking, to, and I hate just that noise. <laughs> oh my God. Probably a robocall. Oh, well that's it. Yeah. Nice that's that's probably what it is. That <laughs> sounds nice. Yes, I, I, have, I, have, I have a nice ring. <laughs> so anyway, I was saying about... Uh, when you're the Tennessee and you're back. <laughs> Thank you so much, Grace. Okay, so I, when we were in Tennessee, my friend Carolyn, and she just, 81, she just died. So she used to tell me, because I was a little down in the beginning, but I knew it was the right move, and it, everything was good, but I just was a little down because I missed mm. everybody. So she said, there's nothing like a good salty dog and a chat that won't, that won't cure it all. A salty dog is grapefruit juice and vodka, which I didn't even know. <laughs> uh, that was her, that was her <coughs> thing. And I never had one. It must be a southern drink. And so she said, I'm going to fix you up. So she gave me this salty dog, and we sat down talking on the porch. And I always remember it because that's what she used to say. Not that she had them a lot, but she knew I needed something, so she made me a salty dog and good conversation. So you got to reach out when you're feeling a little bit down. So, well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I hope that you've gained some knowledge about mental health and how you feel and all the symptoms that you might have, and also to just reach out when you're not feeling, when it doesn't go away. You know, just mark it on, you know, in your head that you really need some more support. So thanks. Well, thank and you. I think I'm not thank here. You. Thank you. I'm not